participants will receive a link to the recording. Now it's being recorded. <laughs> All participants will receive a link to the recording along with a handout called the tip jar. The tip jar will highlight key takeaways, information and prompts from tonight's speaker for you to have as a reference. There will also be a Q&A session following the presentation. So we encourage you to type any questions you may have into the Q&A box at any time as they occur to you. At this time, I'd like to introduce one of our lead coalition sponsors, Kathy Cucciarella, the coalition coordinator for SOMERS Partners in Prevention. Thank you, Linda. Hi, and good evening, everyone. I'm Kathy Cucciarella, the chairperson and coalition coordinator for the SOMERS Partners in Prevention located in SOMERS, New York. SOMERS Partners in Prevention has been in existence for over 50 years, and our mission is to build a safer community by efficiently addressing alcohol and drug use, as well as other risk-taking behaviors through advocacy, hope, and awareness. We're a community alliance to help our youth and community stay alcohol and drug free. SOMERS Partners in Prevention is proud to be one of the sponsoring lead coalitions in the No to Prevent Collaborative, and we're thrilled to bring valuable speakers and informative sessions to the parents, caregivers, guardians, and teachers in our communities. Tonight, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Adam Pletter, and his talk on Screen Smart Parenting. As we know, screens and technology are not going away. So as parents, we need to find the right balance and provoke, promote digital wellness at home. Dr. Pletter is a licensed clinical psychologist with more than 20 years experience specializing in the treatment of children, adolescents, and young adults in his private practice in Bethesda, Maryland. He received his doctoral degree from the George Washington University, and he has been working with families at the onset of the early 2000s digital cultural shift. Dr. Pletter developed a, parent, a parenting approach combining behavior modification theory with parental control systems to better support mental health and child development. Dr. Pletter works with parents and guardians as well as technology companies to help them balance the benefits of the digital world alongside health and safety concerns. He primarily uses the built-in device parental controls paired with the digital access boxes to promote safer exploration of the digital world. Dr. Pletter shares his iParent 101 program in the form of an ebook, online courses, YouTube, tutorials, and live and virtual speaking engagements. With that being said, please welcome Dr. Adam Pletter. Thank you so much. Um... So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, share my screen. I really appreciate you inviting me up. Um, I have a fondness for Westchester. I lived there for uh, several years uh, and I'm um, excited to be here with you all tonight. Thank you again for inviting me. So let me see here. Someone give me a thumbs up or make sure this is working. Thank you. All right. So um, basic plan for tonight, um, probably similar to other speakers. I'm going to try to end around eight of uh, the presentation period um, of, of tonight. Um, my goal for tonight is really to uh, answer your questions and try to get you guys to think about this very complicated parenting landscape that we all find ourselves in. Um, both as a clinician uh, for the last 24 years and a parent for about 20 years, about 20 and a half, um, I, I come to this uh, with not only my expertise, but with a personal mission to try to support as many families as I can. Uh, this is a complicated, uh, nuanced approach, and it's a re in response to a complicated, nuanced set of concerns and um, enhancements. Make no mistake that the digital world really does give us enhancements to our lives and predictable concerns. You already heard my, my background. Um, I've been at this uh, speaking mostly live uh, during the pandemic. I did quite a few webinars more than I'd like to count. Um, 
but uh, I've been doing these live talks since about 2014, um, local here in um, in uh, Montgomery County in, in Maryland, um, right outside of D.C. So been at this a long time, and without further ado, I'm going to jump in. Key, key, key takeaways for tonight, uh, I'm going to really emphasize this idea of balance. I know it's a buzzword that lots of people talk about. I'm going to talk about it slightly differently tonight as a process um, in response to a never-ending supply flow, um, whether you're scrolling or not, a uh, never-ending flow of digital stimulation, and for our children and teenagers, immature brain development. Um, as you'll hear me say if you, in a few minutes, uh, the human brain, whether you can appreciate this or not, doesn't fully develop until about 25 or 30. So we're talking about the entire lifespan of your adolescent at home and even through college, does not have a fully developed prefrontal cortex, which is the main focus of tonight's talk, uh, that part of the brain that is. Um, so that's going to be a big piece of what I talk about tonight. Uh, I'm going to try to offer as many uh, strategies to have a healthy relationship with technology for your families. And I'm going to um, talk a lot about lessening uh, the focus on screens as we seek out that balance and ramping up different ways of coping, leaning on as much as I can on biology. So as a clinical psychologist, uh, clinical in the sense that in terms of my training, my doctorate is in clinical psychology, which means that there's a, a reason why someone would be in my office. It's usually some problem, something that's causing significant impairment or difficulty in their lives. And as I put together these programs, I think about the reason for referral of why you all have dedicated uh, at least an hour, an hour and a half of your time tonight, uh, your time being very valuable after a long day at whatever you guys were doing today. I'm still at work, still in my office here, um, long day. And uh, time is is valuable. Time is finite. And I and I take that very, very seriously that you're dedicating your time to be here and be here with me tonight and us tonight. And so the reason why you're here is probably that you're worried or concerned or have uh, specific questions about how to manage your family uh, during uh, this time of digital exploration and uh, accommodating and, and getting enhanced by all this digital uh, information in front of us. Uh, multiple screens all day long for us as parents and adults and for our kids as well, even if you have very young kids. If you all were in front of me, I would do a quick raise of hands this, just to get a sense of who has young kids, who has middle school. My understanding is this was targeted mostly to middle school and high schoolers, families, uh, but I understand that many families have multiple kids. Uh, and so I'm going to try to focus mostly on middle school and up. But um, obviously, if there's questions on the younger end, um, it's always easier to manage any kind of parenting uh, with younger kids. So I'm going to um, certainly include some of that. But these are the typical reasons for referral. I did include a few specifically as your questions did come through uh, earlier today. So I did uh, add a few more in here. I'm going to really talk a lot about the overuse of tech because that's what tends to lead uh, families and 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 people to feel over, out of balance, off balance, uh, fear of missing out. We'll talk a little bit about screen time limits. I'm going to try to answer your questions around that, uh, understanding that uh, families are different. Um, and uh, having limits in general is not a clear cut all or nothing kind of answer, but certainly we'll give you, I'll give you my take on that. Um, spread of misinformation, uh, role modeling, mentoring, uh, and just encouraging you all to think about how you use screens in your day as an adult. Um, some of you are probably on a screen most of your day, multiple screens for your job. And some of you may really purposely not be on your screen and the type of job that you do might not allow you to be on a screen or encourage that. Um, so I just give that some thought because our kids certainly are growing up in a world at most schools that I'm aware of um, with some type of screen, you know, almost at every period of the day, even into middle school, elementary school, and even preschool um, from what I hear. So I'm gonna jump in. Um, 
I'm still having a hard time seeing this side piece here, but let me just, okay. So, and we'll talk about role of parental controls and uh, we'll talk about multitasking even at nighttime, which impacts sleep. Um, so I'm gonna try to cover all of these pieces. It's act, it's packed uh, hour. And so without further ado, let's jump in. This works. And yes, there will be a, I'm gonna try to hold a good half an hour or so uh, for the Q&A where we could talk about all this in more detail. So I go back to this 2023 report um, uh, where they, uh, out of um, University of Michigan, um, they, they did uh, research where they found that the number one concern for parents was, again, talking about time, the overuse uh, for our kids, that they were on, they're on their uh, phones or some type of screen too much. Gets to your question, questions around screen time limits, you know, what would be appropriate, Can, you know, is it four hours a day, is it five hours a day, and I'm going to lead the witness here a bit and say that all of this is, is potentially problematic use, it's going to cause some type of problem, yet it's required for our modern 2024 life and beyond, um, and so I want to, you know, talk about the overuse of tech and where we could encourage our kids and ourselves because they are learning by watching us. I've learned it by watching you. Um, they are learning by what we are mentoring and, and modeling. And so being aware of how we are using screens, whether it's TV and all day watching football or when you're stopping at a, a traffic light, they are watching us. So be aware of that when, how you're using your phone and your various different screens. Um, what I talk a lot about is if they're um, on their screen and watching YouTube or uh, scrolling on Instagram, what are they not doing? What is being displaced? What is being put aside or avoided potentially when our children are escaping and, and getting pulled in? Both could be true, escaping and being pulled in to their screen. What are they not doing? Um, in terms of reading, in terms of spending time outside with friends, doing other things, um, what are the activities that are being displaced? And again, the impact on sleep, I can't understate. Um, and so if one of your questions is, should, our, should we have some rules around where the phone and, and all the devices go at, at bedtime, my clear answer, that's one I can give a very clear answer about, the clear answer is yes, not in their rooms and having it elsewhere charging where they could focus, one focus on their job at night is to sleep and to restore and to clear out all that waste that builds up during the day, which leads you to feel groggy and moody and inattentive. So yes, multitasking at nighttime is not a good idea. And all of our kids are gonna wanna do that because there's this pull. It's social time, they're active, and it's going to be, you know, that's an area to set limits clearly. Um, so the impact on sleep, I can't understate or overstate. So what I hear from kids and teenagers, sorry, this is just, tell my push forward, it's not moving. Okay. Um, these are the areas that I hear from teenagers. And I work with teenagers all day long uh, in my office. Uh, they are looking for connection first and foremost. They obviously there's tons of fun gaming. Privacy is key. You could ask anybody that works at Apple. Privacy is probably their number one um, factor that they make a lot of decisions to keep everything private. Things on the internet are not private yet they feel private. And if you turn on the news any given day, there's a list of politicians that are being canceled and, and other celebrities because of things that they were doing online that they thought were private, but now they're out in the public space. So it feels private and it should feel private, but we want to teach our kids to be very mindful that it's not. Everything is public and permanent on the internet. Um, tremendous education opportunities on the internet, learning, whether they're learning things just on Instagram reels, they're, le they're learning a lot, or they're learning in an educational setting, informal education, often there is a screen involved. Uh, safety, again, uh, top of the list, uh, the kids want to be safe for sure. There's all kind of crazy pedophiles and dangerous situations online. I'm not sugarcoating that. Um, um, 
and kids are aware of that and they want to feel safe and be safe. And then ultimately, since we're not raising future kids, we're raising future adults, the independence is really key. They want to be independent. And this won't be the first or last time I mention this tonight, the clear metaphor or parallel that I'm going to keep going back to tonight is when um, I grew up in New York, so I don't know if it's still the same laws there, but at, at age 16, I remember getting my permit to drive a car. There's a clear parallel here. Um, here in Maryland, it's 59 months to get a permit, but then it's it's through the state with lots of rules and lots of regulations and lots of practice under supervision to get access to that car key and to, to, to be able to manage that big, dangerous machine. Um, our phones are not quite as big, um, but they are also machines that are potentially dangerous. And But this pull for independence is what drives them. They want to be independent and manage it. That's why there's always a pull uh, for our young kids in elementary school and middle school to get their first phone. Um, everyone else, I'm the last one. I hear this every day. I'm the last one without a phone. Could, the kid could be in fourth grade, and he might actually be telling the truth that the, that the average age in America right now, I think, is about 10 to get a smartphone. I'm not encouraging that. I would encourage uh, to delay and wait, but that is the uh, on average what I hear and what I read about. So that's what our kids are looking for. Parents, what I hear for the most part is we are focused on safety. We are fo focused on health and self-regulation, and again, that independence. We are not raising a future kid. We want our kids, and I have a 20-year-old at home or out in college, so I've lived through this. I'm still living through this. We are raising our kids to be future adults so they can manage themselves, most likely with multiple screens in front of them, in their pockets, in their bed at night. Um, unfortunately, it's not what I would recommend, but it's what's happening on college campuses. They're not keeping the phone in the hallway. They're keeping it with them. Um, it's part of our modern life here, but it leads at, at during high school, especially to age appropriate conflict, just like when your kid wants to grab those car keys and go off and do what they want to do. Parents are there to set supervision and limits um, a, around how and when they're going to be driving. So we have the same goal. I often say the same team um, to raise them to be future adults. It's no different than the last, I'll say 50 years, but maybe even beyond that, from generation from generation for hundreds of years uh, of human uh, evolution, hundreds of thousands of years even, if I could say that, um, it's just a very different landscape now where parents feel ill-equipped and desperate. That's, that's a feeling I hear a lot from parents, especially in my office, that they are desperate, they don't know what to do, they feel helpless because their kids know more than them, Everything is moving so fast, and they're just trying to help their kid manage on a day-to-day -day basis so they could be the future adult. So when I say same team, we are social animals, just like these, I don't know if those are bamboo uh, um, chimps or uh, some other type of primate, but they're, they're taking care of each other. They're protecting themselves. They're grooming each other. They're, 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 they're living as a community. Here we are using technology to be a community tonight. They're using uh, um, what they can to take care of each other, to survive and to foster independence. When parents ha uh, are fostering independence, of course, you're going to have a judgment on what your children are doing. That's, that's natural. That didn't start with the internet. Um, we are primary teachers at the very beginning. So keeping that in mind, whether we're talking about the animal kingdom or human animals, we are here joining together as a community, spending our time to help our children learn and develop into future healthy, successful adults. By doing that, we are seeking out patterns. All animals, but especially intelligent animals and humans are one of them, seek out patterns in our world so we have some understanding of what to expect. And I'm not gonna get stuck on this because I have a lot to cover, but just take a minute to think about how you seek out patterns. Certain things look a certain way and you sort of know what to expect. And again, and you know, if it's A, B, A, B, you know what the pattern is after A, B. And so the only way to change a pattern is by adding a new element. 
A, B, C. Now what comes after B is not A, it's C. It's a new pattern. And so having reference points are really critical to that end. Um, so first reference point is that's a, that's a typewriter um, for those of you who may not recognize that. Um, and these are when those apps were released. And you could see even YouTube, which seems like it's been here forever. If you ask your kids, it has been because most of your kids, if they're in high school, YouTube was born in 2005. They've no known different. It's always been here. Uh, Roblox, Instagram, Peekaboo, which now is Snapchat, um, 2011. So we're getting a little bit more current. But even in 2011, we're talking about um, kids that, you know, it, it, they don't really know a time where there wasn't Snapchat on their phone. Uh, Fortnite took over the world a couple of years ago. That literally was released in 2017. Um, it feels like not that long ago to someone old like me. Um, so just keep that in mind that, that having these reference points ground us in having some sense of where we are now and where we're going. Again, just really quickly, you know, if you have a child in preschool, they were born potentially in, in 2022. If they're in like in the twos, like that was two years ago. Like you, you could do the math on that. Kindergarten, 2019. Um, again, so they don't know anything different. Um, speaking of reference points, if you're on the older end like me, you know, we grew up in front of a screen, um, Channel 13 up in New York. Um, I watched Sesame Street. I was learning um, through a screen even back in the 1970s. Baby Einstein came another 20 years later, Dora the Explorer. I, I highlight these because they're all interactive. Sesame Street, they would talk to the camera. They would, oh, what letter is this? And it's this reciprocity, this serve and return kind of concept of, 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 of parenting. And Dora the Explorer, you know, and there's been many like this, would ask, you know, the kid would sit on the couch and the backpack would pop up and like, oh, what are you, what's the answer? How do you say this in Spanish? And it's all this learning. Now with touch screens, it's that times whatever exponent you like because it's so integrated into their experience on the touch screen that it's all this back and forth. But it does not replace the parent-child dialogue and parent-child interaction and, and reciprocity. That's the back and forth. So please keep that in mind. And even with a teenager, keep that in mind. It's the dialogue that I'm gonna keep coming back to that you could have with your kids, with your teenagers. So as I said earlier, the typical human brain doesn't fully develop or fully develops around 25 to 30. Again, as I said, that's over the entire course of the child's or adolescent's young adulthood up to, you know, again, you know, past college. Um, and so it creates this recipe um, for, you know, mostly kids under or teenagers and young adults, young humans under 25. So part one of the recipe is that our brains, the braking system specifically, if you go back to a car metaphor, it's the brakes, it's the holding you back. That's what this front part of our brain is for. It helps us slow down. It's all the executive functions, the regulation part of our brain. That is relatively weak, even at 25. They're still developing that, we're still developing that part of our brain. So that's part one of the recipe. Part two is an overactive emotional center of your brain where by design, kids, if you go out to a playground, there's a lot of noise, kids are laughing, crying, there's a lot of emotion, which encourages young kids and teenagers, risk-taking, to go out and learn about their world. Um, how much should I do this? How much, like, how do, they have to learn through experience. Wisdom is experience through learning. Um, I'm sorry, learning through experience is wisdom. That's why old people are more wise than younger people, typically, because they've had more experience. So having an overactive emotional part of your brain is going to encourage that animal, that human, to go out and learn about their world so they're better equipped to manage themselves. So that's part two. So weak breaking, overactive go, 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 you know, accelerator. And then part three, add in the internet, and you already know this, unlimited interest-based algorithms feeding more and more of, of what the child or teenager is interested in, um, ne never-ending supply of amazing content. And if it's not amazing, you know this, they're going to scroll on to find what is amazing. 
And so it's it's highly engaging, interactive, serve and return reciprocity where they're getting feedback from their experience, which pulls them in even more. Um, 2023, uh, this is the latest um, research that I could find on this, but they found uh, Common Sense Media does great research, great reviews, great people out of Stanford, highly recommend that website. But they found last year that on the average, two over 200 times your child's phone is buzzing in their pocket or in their backpack or wherever they're going. 230 on average. Take a second to think about that. That means that throughout the day, multiple times an hour, multiple, that there's this alert system going off, pulling their priority system, their, their executive function, the front part of their brain is being pulled to prioritize something that in all likelihood is not a priority. But if your phone buzzes, it makes you feel like someone's reaching out to you and you need to know what that is. That's just the way we're wired. And so it constantly is pulling our attention away from the thing that really should be the priority, which is, let's say, your schoolwork or, or you're hanging out with your friend or you're, whatever you're doing or you're at dinner and you're talking about, I don't know, you're a vacation that you guys are going on. If your phone is there too, you might be talking about that vacation that you're excited about, but your attention is going to constantly keep being pulled away because that's how our nervous system works. It's not different. It's the same thing. If something buzzes, we're going to want to know what that is by design. It just pulls us in in that way. Um, similarly, you know, yes, why does Taylor I have to include Taylor Swift, right? Uh, why, why does she wear red lipstick or anyone? It, the red in particular hits our optic nerve differently. I'm sure, it goes back to evolution and red things were dangerous and we needed to be more aware of things that were red. Uh, but it gets our attention. And lo and behold, things that need to get our attention are red. The answering machine light back in the 80s was red, typically. Uh, stop signs. Again, you get my point. I don't want to overdo this. Red things pull our attention. So on our phones, notifications are red and they pull us in because it grabs our attention more than other colors. So my suggestion, I have a whole YouTube channel on how I go through specifically on iPhones and Wi-Fi other parental controls, you could definitely check that out. Um, I'm going to encourage you to be thoughtful for yourselves and to teach our kids and teenagers to be thoughtful. It only takes seconds to go into the settings, and you can do this on Android also and on your computers, um, and turn notifications on and off when you want to be benefited by that notification. Because most of the time, the notification is not helpful to you. It feels helpful but often feelings are lies. It's not true. If, if someone is buzzing you in the middle of class, in all likelihood, that's not as important as what you're trying to learn for this test tomorrow. And you could check whatever the person that was sent you that was funny in five minutes, 10 minutes after class, and there would be no difference. But in the moment, it's pulling you. If you're at the airport and you want to know when, if a gate has changed, all right, well, that's something you want to be notified in that moment. Right. So being selective, again, this is nuance. It's not all or nothing. And the phones are set up in a way where you can make it nuanced. You can make it. This is on. This is off. Oh, I'm going to this new place here. So I'm going to turn this one on because I want to be notified. And being thoughtful about that is really critical for our young kids. Being selective, as I say, um, uh, urgent priority shifts is the way, is the way I'm phrasing that because it feels urgent in that moment and it, and it pulls our attention. Again, I have a whole YouTube channel and where I show you um, how to go into settings and turn some of these things on and off and setting up all of screen time and all of that. You could definitely check that out. Uh, this became popular a couple of years ago. Um, uh, Tristan Harris, uh, I think uh, used to be at Google. He, he spread this around. I just think it's a cool challenge. Um, you could turn off again. I have this on my phone. You know, it's kind of an interesting challenge that you could do with your family. How long can you last? Um, keeping it on grayscale. Um, you'll feel it. It feels annoying not having those colors popping, but it also doesn't pull as much. It's, it really is true. So it's something you can engage your kids around. They're not going to keep it on this because again, the colors feel better, but it's a way of challenging yourself to see how you get pulled in. 
Um, again, apps like TikTok serve up personalized, often irresistible content on demand. Uh, school phone use is nearly universal, um, and the policies need to become more consistent and reliable, um, at least within the school. I know it may vary school to school, and we'll talk about that more during the q and I'm sure. Um, but that's that's what I'm hearing more and more, both from teachers that I know, administrators, and the kids in my office. Um, right now, we're in this sort of major adjustment period of all these new policies, and often they're not being um, consistently enforced, and it's leading to more and more um, tension and chaos at times. At least that's what I hear from kids. Um, again, there's, it's a help and a hindrance to sleep. Lots of people use them uh, for listening to the Calm app or music or white noise. All of that is great, but it also, since they're all in one device, it pulls for more and more attention, um, pushing bedtimes later. Um, you do not need to use your phone as your alarm clock. They sell lots and lots of alarm clocks um, that are even novel and cool and you need to do something to wake yourself up, you do not need to use your phone for your alarm clock um, as a regular alarm clock in your room, especially for our kids. Um, again, it's about the multitasking, pulling our attention, sh shifting our attention back and forth, especially with a weak breaking system, weak regulatory system. So in terms of reference point, this is my first phone. I always like to include that. Again, just to make the point uh, that our current phones are all in one devices, this is what I could fit on a slide. Um, take a quick look around, but you you know this already. Um, these are amazing machines that enhance our lives. I'm not going to get stuck on this, but I do believe, get ready for a weird thing. I say a lot of weird things on purpose to get your attention. Um, we are the first generation of cyborgs. This is my external hard drive. And what you could see on the screen um, helps me function. I don't have to carry around. I went on vacation a couple months ago. I thought in my own head, oh yeah, I'm gonna bring a separate camera. This way I don't have to bring my phone around. Having that extra camera was a complete waste. I brought my phone. I tried not to be on my phone using it as a phone, but as my camera, that's what I'm used to using now. So it's all in one and it's amazing and it pulls. Um, for our attention and multitasking because multitasking literally feels really good. You feel productive, even though it's much more superficial, typically, in terms of the shifting attention. It's the efficiency. That's the multitasking. The efficiency of technology enhances the flow of information. That's what the internet's all about. Connected computers um, in enhancing the flow of communication and connection and greater stimulation. So again, it requires a nuanced approach. So uh, as I mentioned, um, we could talk in the Q&A about what your school districts are actually implementing. I'm assuming there's some shift this year. Um, and again, it's the wide range from no phones at all across every grade level to some more restricted in the younger grades um, to only, you know, just don't bring it out during class. Again, I hear even locally here in um, Montgomery County, Maryland, I hear lots of versions of this, even within the same school district. Um, there's no simple answer and it requires a nuanced approach. I am in full support of the concept of these uh, policies. My push, and I said this in front of the Board of Education back in 2018, would is to be consistent with some policy because there is learning impact, educational impact of these devices. Um, it's not a, a, a one-way street where it's only enhancing our education. It's definitely not. Um, so having some clear policies and research around this is really key. Again, requires a nuanced approach, which unfortunately the way humans are wired, all of us, um, when things are not clear, all or nothing, us versus them, think about you turn on the news, everything is us versus them, you you know, politics, um, uh, the chaos of the world, the tragedies around the world, it's who do we blame, it's us versus them. It makes us anxious as humans when there's not a clear answer. Even some of your questions tonight, I'm going to do my best to answer, but I'm not going to have the one answer and it's going to make you anxious because you're going to want me to tell you what to do. At least that's I hear I hear that a lot. Um, and I'm not because I don't have that answer. I don't know you. I don't know your, your family. There's all kind of different variables at play. Um, and it's not a simple answer. And it makes us anxious. We want answers. Um, 
And we have to tolerate that discomfort and do the best we can to raise our kids to be those future adults. Tremendous benefit in schools before I move past this. Um, assistive technology, I'm assuming anyone out there with any kind of special education needs, a 504 plan, an IEP, there's tremendous, tremendous accommodations through the technology now, assistive technology. Um, this is a local colleague of mine, fantastic book. She updates it all the time, Joan Green. She's a speech language pathologist, and she has dedicated herself on keeping up to date on um, all of these different tools that are out there to the point where someone who is benefiting from some of these accommodations, the stigma is way down because it's just universal now in every classroom. And no one knows what you're listening to on a, on a headset um, because it might be many, many different things. And you're getting direct help with uh, some need that you have. Um, dictation, note-taking, brainstorming, you know, add in AI, and it's just tremendous tremendous the enhancements that um, our students are being offered now and and even as uh, adults working now tremendous enhancements to our our lives with major compromise and concerns um, this is a research study out of england and i'm just going to highlight these two pieces here um, because in, uh, i know one of your questions is going to be about screen time not all screen time is the same it's 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 um, I, I think about it like a diet. Not all food is the same. Even healthy food, if you eat too much of it, can give you a stomach ache. If you eat a bushel of apples, even though apple a day keeps the doctor away, you know, if you eat too much of even something healthy, it can cause problems. So not all screen time is the same. Please keep your mind on that. And social media and other screen-based activities bring both enhancements, benefits, and significant harm and well-being to our mental health. Um, it's connected to the mental health crisis. I'm not saying it's causing it, but it's certainly contributing in very real ways that I see in my clinical office every day. Um, again, requires a nuanced approach. This is a colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Cliff Sussman. I love the way he describes the role of dopamine in our brains. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that human beings need to survive. It was developed because when we were evolving, we needed to get certain things right away or we, or we wouldn't survive. You know, for example, when we were hungry, we had to eat right away. Um, if we were being chased by an animal, we had to run away right away. If we were, you know, it, it, all of our survival depended on getting our needs met quickly. Um, and so you know, dopamine is the neurotransmitter associated with getting our needs met quickly. A lot of people misunderstand and they think that dopamine is about, um, you know, anything that gives you pleasure. The flow of dopamine is much more significant if you're not having to wait for that pleasure. Right. So it's the role of dopamine and the immediacy, how quickly you feel that good feeling promotes that behavior to continue. And um, as you already know, I think, um, being online and doing lots of things, there's certain activities that give us more dopamine in general and more immediate dopamine. And digital stimulation is one of those things where it leans in on this right now feeling. That's why when your phone buzzes, it sort of feels like an itch. You have to scratch it. You have to kind of go look, you know, because... It feels good to get that information. It helps, you know, back in our primitive brains, it, on some level, it feels like it's increasing our survival um, because the dopamine is there to keep us alive, to, to promote doing things to help us, as he just described. Um, and the digital stimulation definitely targets that type of emotion. Um, so it has a major impact on these front, you know, prefrontal cortex demands uh, around executive functioning, um, prioritizing, as I already talked about, sequencing, shifting your attention, um, holding yourself back, regulating, inhibiting, and uh, among others, multitasking, the shifting attention back and forth. That's what multitasking is. Um, so we're talking about this prefrontal cortex. Our kids don't have a fully developed brain until 25 to 30. And so it's our job as parents, caregivers, teachers, excuse me, to scaffold, to be in lieu of the prefrontal cortex because theirs isn't fully developed, just like in the animal kingdom, those um, uh, chimpanzees 
you know, the, the older, the older uh, chimps would pull their kids back. You probably have seen these videos on nature channels where the, the, the little chimp is walking out on the branch and the mom kind of yanks him back because the branch is not uh, strong enough to hold him or that it's, that's it, the older, more wise animals in the community are teaching and mentoring and protecting the young kids, the younger, the younger in the family, in the community. And this is no different. And so our job is not to do it for them, is not to stand over them and tell them what to do every minute of the day. That's not going to work. Um, hovering over them and making, you know, everything easy for them is not the answer, but scaffolding underneath is the answer supporting and providing support so they can get to the next level of development, whether you're a teenager and the next development is young adulthood or you're, you know, a tweener and getting ready to be a teenager. It, it, the parent's job is to scaffold. Um, if you're looking for a really good, um, uh, something to watch with your teenager, probably as young as 10, I haven't seen it in a while, but I, I think that's, it would be fine. Um, on Netflix, there's a really great um, documentary series called Explained, and the one on the teenage brain, there's a bunch that are really excellent, and they're like 20 minutes, they're short, there's animation, it's well done, it's usually hosted by someone famous, um, I don't remember who hosted the teenage brain one, but they talk about um, parents being in lieu, in place of the prefrontal cortex for our kids, and that that was my takeaway from that one, and I just, I offer that to you. Um so again, we're talking about an evolution of access online, enhancing our kids and our human functioning. Um, sorry, can't see what's behind this. Okay, sorry. To, adapting to the webinar format here. I have to keep moving things around on my screen. Um, so yeah, it, you know, so again, I'm talking about the evolution of access, information flow, communication, and power, which is meaningful when you're a teenager. Power is huge. Who's in charge? Who is popular? All of this is connected. Um, and so this brings me back to what I started with, which was this idea of balance being a buzzword and everyone talking about being off balance. I'm here to say, I don't know if I'm the first person to say this, and I probably won't be the last, but I'm here to say that balance is not a destination. It's not something that we're going to reach. It's a balance is literally a process, a process of adjusting and adapting, taking in new information and adjusting to temporarily feel balanced. But it's temporary because they're just like these kids riding their bike. There might be a bump. They're going around a turn. You're not balanced when you're perfectly straight. You're going to fall if that's how you ride a bike. You have to adjust. And so... Again, balance is a concept of, of adjustment. It's a constant state of adjustment involving trade-offs and compromise um, at every turn. Um, and again, so I focus on what is the value of the enhancements. And again, if you haven't heard me correctly yet, it requires a nuanced approach. Um, I'm always going to encourage in terms of seeking out balance as an adjustment to look at the evolution of access but it's not an evolution of biology, at least not yet. Our brain structures are the same as they were 50 years ago. They are. Our, you know, our neck muscles might be starting to change as we're constantly looking down, but our brain structures have not changed, if at all, not much. Biology is the same. And so leaning in on biology, um, I, I talk to kids all the time about using breathing and really trying to extend that exhale to activate the parasympathetic nervous system, which is the calming part of our brains. And it tells us that we're safe. Having a little bit of that longer exhale helps being outside in nature, um, using all five senses. And I mean all five, including smell and touch as ways of coping. I have these tea bags I keep in my office um, you know, for, for kids to actually, to see what it's like to smell something different, um, to engage their brain in a different way, especially since they've been sitting uh, a good part of the day, staring at a screen, um, for most of us, as I'm doing that right now. And so are you. Um, so again, the idea of, um, using a different part of your brain and different part of your body is key. 
um, little research there. You know, there's there's multiple of these studies coming out now, but at least 20, 120 minutes a, a week. That's not much. It's two hours in nature is associated with good health. They're, they can, they're measuring these things and it, and it, it makes a difference. Um, so some of you are sitting there, um, you know, wondering like, okay, does my kid actually have a problem? Um, you know, a lot of this is problematic, but it's not necessarily clinical. So again, here's a couple of questions to ask. Is your child physically healthy? Is he getting sleep? Is he waking up in the middle of the night? Is he sneaking downstairs in the middle of the night? Is he connecting socially, even online? They're real friends online. It's not fake. They're really developing relationships with appropriate people online. That's a thing. Um, even if they don't go to their school, they might be from another state. Does it raise safety concerns? And are they really a 12-year-old kid that they're talking to? Well, that's a really good question. But th it is a thing. It's not, not everyone is not always a pedophile. There are 12-year-olds connecting um, through different platforms. And it's concerning, but it doesn't mean we have to shut everything down. We have to talk with them. We have to encourage being thoughtful and smart about how and who they're engaging with. Um, and finally, are they engaging in learning new digital skills? Um, the sc screens and this technology is not going away. They're going to, it's going to be required for their job, probably in many ways, more than I can even uh, conceptualize right now. And so it's not just about escaping into the digital world. It's about leaning in and learning real skills that they could use into their adulthood. Um, so I'm just moving things around again. Um, so, you know, what are the symptoms of screen addiction? You know, I, I, I don't want to overstate this, but um, digital stimulation, as I said earlier, does dysregulate all of us. And it impacts directly attention, anxiety, mood, and social functioning. There's direct impact on that. Um, but it doesn't mean it's, it's a clinical problem just because um, your attention is shifting back and forth, but it can be. And so here's nine... Um, things to consider um, to, to kind of think through if you're if your children are struggling. Um, you know, a lot of it comes down to control. Can they get off? Are they having a tantrum? You know, are they coming up down from the basement with a red face and, you know, can't drink enough water because for the last four hours they've been down there sweating and yelling, you know, at fortnight um, and they forgot to drink. Again, back to biology. They need to drink. They need to come up and take a break. They need to go outside. They need to do other things. Um, so are they in control over that? Can they make a plan for themselves? I'm going down for 20 minutes and there's a timer that they're in charge of. Um, so you're less involved hammering them and, and, and hovering over them. And it's more on them that you're encouraging and then you're talking to them about it. You're setting it up with a dialogue. Um, is there a loss of interest in other activities? That's always key. Does it seem to preoccupy them? Or even when they're not playing, that's all they think about. That's all they talk about. And it's interfering. Again, the idea of addiction is that it's interfering with the person's functioning. And often, right out of addiction literature, there's some symptom of withdrawal when the, when the substance or activity is taken away. They can't tolerate that. And then tolerance where they need more and more of that activity to, to feel satisfied. They can't just play an hour of, of Roblox. They need to play four hours. Um, and, and, it, and it's becoming more and more disruptive and interfering. And often there's a level of deception where they're not honest about it. Uh, with you and maybe not with themselves also, especially as they're getting older and you might have a 17 year old at home who's not honest with himself about their use. So again, I come back to as a clinical psychologist, what is the level of disruption? And so shifting um, into what we can do about it is I would come up with a clear plan with some sort of media plan with clear, expected, reasonable rules that are going to change over time starting with, you know, it's an adult device, where it could, should be used, passwords are shared, um, especially depending on, you know, younger um, middle schoolers requiring permission to download apps. Doesn't mean you're going to say no. In fact, I would say you're not going to say no. It's, it's almost never a no, it's a not yet, because eventually, chances are, unless it's a crazy, ridiculous, bad app that is dangerous, which I can't even think of one right now, 
um, eventually, as they become more and more uh, of an adult or older, as um, they're going to have whatever that app is. So it's a not yet. But having some dialogue, forcing that dialogue by requiring permission is really important. And then finally, my most basic behavioral tenant that I could offer you tonight is as your children act older, in general, they're going to be treated older. That's how our society works. If you break a lot of rules, you're going to be treated younger. There's going to be more restrictions on you in very scary, real ways and in minor ways. But act older, you will be treated older. And all of this is temporary. The rules that you're putting in place at the beginning are not necessarily going to be the rules that you're going to have um, in a couple of months even, let alone a couple of years. So again, as I just reminding you, devices charged outside the bedroom and that they're not grabbing it in the first thing in the morning and just starting their day in a, in a dopamine high um, because that's going to put them in a deficit for the rest of the day. Um, generally speaking, I want to encourage you all to think about and encourage our kids to do um, low dopamine activities first and then the higher dopamine activities, especially the activities that pull for that immediate dopamine uh, second. Have that as being the reward. It's like having your vegetables and then chocolate cake. If you eat lots of chocolate cake first, chances are you might eat some vegetables if you like the vegetables, but chances are you're going to eat less because it doesn't taste as good. It doesn't feel as good. There's less dopamine, in fact. Um, so this is, you know, you could just make a, a media plan on your own. This is the one that I recommend in the last couple of years. I used to use the word contract. I, I moved away from that. I, it, it's, it, it is an agreement, but it's really a media plan. It's setting up a, a set of expectations and guidelines encouraging learning experiences, again, building wisdom. As your children are learning and trying this out and trying that out, they're getting more and more access as they're moving forward. Um, and again, it's the digital media diet, if you will, that it's not all junk food, it's not all health food. It's, a, it's an adjustment, it's a balancing act between the different devices and the different layers of content. So I'm talking about proactive parenting um, and this is sort of my three-step approach here, that we're beginning with clear expectations and rules. Let's see. Um, there's that uh, healthychildren.org um, will offer you that media plan. Um, it just sort of populates and you can kind of put in. Um, and again, it's, it's it, and you can do it with your kids and it's changing. I do encourage setting ups, depending on the types of devices, some type of enforceable um, parental controls, not that I want to rely on the parental controls that they're going to parent your kid. That's an illusion of control. It's not going to do that. Most of the parent parental controls don't work um, as advertised, certainly the Apple ones. And if you're listening, Apple, um, they don't work. Um, and we'll talk about it later, but I have a whole campaign trying to get parents to give Apple feedback on their screen time because iPhones are still, and iPads and iMacs are still um, the number one choice that I hear about for teenagers. And yet the basic parental controls that are that come built in don't work. And it's it's a dangerous setup because um, parents think it's working and or they don't, or then they don't even set it at all. But I encourage you to use them and see it as a way of forcing the dialogue. Even if it doesn't work, you know you have an app limit for two hours for Instagram and you see your kid hour upon hour on there, ask them, hey, what's going on? Did that limit not work? Oh, it's still not working. All right. You know, having some dialogue around that is really the key. That's the that's the parental control. It's the dialogue that comes out of that um, having the limit there. It's not the You've been doing such a great job. You got all your homework done. Um, you just took the SATs, whatever it is. Um, yeah, you want to have another hour, you know, whatever. You're going for a sleepover. I'll turn off downtime, whatever it is. You could have a conversation and you're supporting, you're scaffolding their growing independence. Obviously, with younger kids and teenagers, lots of versions. I am not promoting iPhones. It is not the uh, phone of choice if you're looking to set these kind of limits. There's lots of other companies out there. Um, from Bark Phone to MM Guardian to there's many, many out there. I'll call them dumb phones, non-smartphones, watches, iWatches, all kind of gizmos. 
Um, I think Bark uh, down in Atlanta, they're coming out with a watch also. Again, there's a market out there. So don't feel like you have to go to the iPhone. You're going to have pressure probably um, to because uh, kids want iPhones. Um, so do adults. Um, but there are other options out there that especially at the beginning you can consider. And then finally, my behavioral modification piece of this, uh, given my background as a clinical psychologist, I'm piecing this all together, having clear basic rules, target behaviors, things that we're working on to get to an outcome of your child being capable of being a, a future adult, having some sort of parental control that you're able to set enforceable limits or at least have dialogues when the limits don't work, um, and then attending, pay, paying attention uh, to the positive behaviors that you see and offering new levels of access as your child or teenager is consistently demonstrating, not just saying what they're going to do, but demonstrating the appropriate, responsible, and yes, yeah, safe behaviors over time. And so create this level system. Oops, sorry. You create this level system where it's basically like you're training your kid to be a future adult. You know, just like when they learned to drive a car, there was a level system. First is the permit. Then you have to take a certain amount of uh, driver's ed, and then you have to get a certain amount of hours, and then you have to take a road test. There's a level system. Then finally, still under your supervision, then they get access to the car that they could drive independently, still with your permission. Here's the Surgeon General back in May. I worry that right now, if you look at the, the guidelines from the platforms, that age 13 uh, is when kids are technically allowed to use social media. I personally, based on the data I've seen, believe that 13 is too early. And I think that it's a time, you know, early adolescence where kids are developing their identity, their sense of self. It's a time where it's really important for us to be thoughtful about what's going into how they think about their own self-worth and their relationships. And the skewed and often distorted environment of social media often does a disservice to many of those children. We have some of the best designers and, and product developers in the world who have designed these products to make sure people are maximizing the amount of time they spend on these platforms. And if we tell a child, use a force of your willpower to control how much time you're spending, you're pitting a child against the world's greatest product designers, and that's just not a fair fight. And so that's why I, I think our kids need help. Right. And the help, hopefully, is coming from policy, both on an uh, educational level, uh, board of education policies, government policies, just like, you know, in the 1970s, the auto industry uh, didn't on their own enact, you know, all these safety measures to bring about uh, anti-lock brakes and seat belts and airbags. All of that came through regulation to protect the public. And it's coming. And just, you know, last week, Instagram came out with these teen accounts. It's a fantastic step forward. It's not enough but it's a start. And so I, I was really pleased to see that. So back to my level system. Um, again, I'm trying to offer you things that you could walk out of here with tonight uh, and, and consider doing. And depending on the age of your kid, you may not want to start with box one, um, but coming up with a plan that is reasonable and customized to your family for your kid, that you have a path forward where you're offering them more access as you go forward in time based on their age and based on what they're demonstrating. And, you know, I, 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 I cap it at five boxes because that seems reasonable. In your family, you might have three boxes or you might have two. You know, like this is, you have your privileges and then when you mess up, because you're going to mess up, you're learning, trial and error learning, this is where we're going to pull it back. And this is, you know, you're not grounded because maybe that's an old phrase, but there's some sort of pullback where you have to change your behavior, Jimmy, Johnny, whatever, Sally, whatever your kid's name is. And when you change your behavior, you're going to get more of what you want. And that's the setup. That is the tenant of behavioral behavior modification. You change your behavior, you get what you want. It's the changing behavior that is the goal. It's, that's the outcome that we're going for. And again, we're scaffolding through this process independence. So um, very quickly, um, uh, helping teens, again, I talked about notifications, especially during homework time. Um, I, I'm always looking for new uh, gadgets and ways of helping. I haven't quite found that magic answer yet. This is called Brick. I just got it a couple of days ago. 
Um, we could talk about it during Q&A, but it's basically a way that you, you it bricks your phone. You could turn off lots of different apps, whatever you customize it, and it doesn't turn back on until you touch this brick again. Um, again, it's not really being marketed to parents yet, but I reached out to them because I really see an opening here, especially for homework time for a middle schooler where those apps that you all agree to, and I'm assume your child would agree to that having Snapchat while he's doing his homework, not a great idea, but having Snapchat when he's hanging out with his friends might be a good idea. Pro social might be, we could talk about that, but it gives us an ability to turn things on and off in a way that is enforceable and gets that dialogue going. So I just you know, offer that. Um, again, you could try not to text during the day. Again, in general, um, I'm, I'm really encouraged by all of these new uh, policies. Uh, we're at the very, we're on page one, sentence one of this new phase. And um, I hope that things are going to continue to move forward in this way. And we're going to get um, more consistent uh, policies. There's my campaign. You can go to my website. Um, iParent 101, I am really trying to get Apple's attention to fix their software. That's what that campaign's about. Um, iParent 101, it's right on the front page of my website. You could check that out. Um, you probably already know this, but there's tremendous support out there online, ironic or not. Um, lots of different groups. These are just a few uh, that I'm part of. Um, uh, that Fortnite group was featured on Good Morning America many years ago uh, that I started. We could talk about that in the Q&A in terms of understanding the gameplay, Roblox 2, um, understanding so you're setting appropriate limits. Um, all of these communities are interest-specific, so you could find the community that you're looking for. Um, all kind of podcasts. This Screen Deep is brand new. Um, it's a great organization out of New York, I think on Long Island. Um, but this is a brand new podcast, and um, they're going through the research and brain development, and it's really well done. Um, so I wanted to include that here um, just to kind of give you guys some resources um, that you could use uh, moving forward. I mentioned Common Sense Media earlier. Great uh, for reviews of everything from movies to TV shows to apps. It will give you a sense um, before you say um, yes or not yet. Remember, it's probably not a no, it's probably a not yet, but looking up on Common Sense Media to get a sense of uh, what people are saying about these uh, apps and movies and TV shows would be really helpful. Um, generally speaking, I am encouraging us as we move into the Q&A here to delay as much as possible. Um, I'm not going to go as extreme as Jonathan Haidt in um, that generation, um, Anxious Generation book. Um, um, that's a great uh, resource, by the way, um, but definitely delaying much of what he describes, I agree with. Um, I'm I'm encouraging you all to set limits to force the dialogue. The limits are not the parental control. The limits encourage the dialogue, which that is the parental control. Otherwise, it's an illusion and you're you're kidding yourself thinking that those uh, the screen time limits on your on the iPhone is going to somehow stop your kid. It will not. They will get around it very quickly, even if it was working. And to be clear, it's not. Um, modeling, mentoring. Again, humans learn by doing with practice. All humans learn by doing with practice. And again, balance is a, not a goal or destination to reach, yet a process of constant adjustment and ad adaptation. That is what we're doing here on this planet. We're adjusting, we're adapting, um, sometimes under very extreme circumstances as most of us lived um, through this pandemic. Uh, you know, we, we were challenged in many ways and we're still seeing the uh, some of the remnants of that. Uh, and certainly, you know, on the news today and, you know, these devastating hurricanes, we are challenged and we have to adapt um, sometimes through quite quite a bit of misery and, and struggle. Um, generally speaking, clear and reasonable boundaries help humans in all stages of de development in life manage expectations and learn to self-regulate. Digital stimulation dysregulates. So we have to learn and teach our kids to not only balance, but dysregulate. Look at, the, look at those faces. Look how intense they are. It's amazing, right? It is. So um, that's my website, iparent101.com. Eager for the Q&A. Um, uh, 
Uh, I, I there's a new feature on my website. Uh, I call it iParent One One To Go, um, where I go through quick. Um, that's why I call it To Go. You could take it with you. Manageable tips. I'm trying to go through as many apps as I can, um, and getting uh, you know younger people to help me write these. Um, that's one on Snapchat. That was the second one. I think the first one was on Instagram. I've done TikTok. Again, you could check that out. It's on my website, iparent101.com. Um, I did invite my intern tonight, um, Milo, to join us for the Q&A. Uh, he is a computer science uh, graduate and a full-time teacher now. And I'm, I'm hopeful that he will, um, as we're talking about different schools, um, I'm sure he will have some insights to share. So thank you for being here tonight, Milo. And uh, I'm going to turn it back over to you all um, for the Q&A. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, so... Before we dive into our Q&A, we would appreciate everyone's feedback on tonight's presentation. Simply open the camera on your phone, a very good use of your phone, and point it at the QR code you see on your screen right now, and a link will pop up to access our survey. The survey will also be in the email that we will be sending out following the presentation. It is very short, but it provides us with valuable feedback to inform future webinars. So thank you in advance for completing it. Thank you. And I also want to talk to you just to invite you to join us for our January webinar, um, Teen Mental Health, Time for a Reset with Dr. Laura Kastner. You can use this QR code or just visit our website, notaprevent.org, to register for this timely presentation. At this time, I will turn it over to Kathy for Q&A. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Linda, and thank you, Dr. Butter. Um, truly an amazing presentation. Um, what I'm going to do first, um, we have a couple of questions that came in on the live um, chat and Q&A. So I'd like to start with those first. And then we have the questions that have come in. People are allowed to send questions in when they register. So some of these things you have um, answered, um, but I'm just going to just say again, because I think um, there is a question here. Kids have ways to change screen time. How do we deal with this? So let's just kind of start with that. I believe you you had mentioned it, but sure. No, I, again, I would um, often with uh, patients that I work with, I do this three step process, and I'll and I'll say it briefly here of uh, predict, recognize, and then do different. And so I can make the clear prediction. Predicting is not seeing the future, by the way. It's making a guess based on patterns and what uh, what information we have. Right. So we can predict with pretty high confidence that most kids and teenagers, when they want to, they will get around the screen limits, um, the app limits, the, you know, I don't, I don't care what device you're using. And I could be wrong about that. Maybe it's, there's some new devices out there where if things are really locked down. I haven't really seen that, um, even if that's what's being advertised. Um, and so. Well, as I as I said earlier, I would predict that I would recognize when you know it seems like they're uh, the limit that you have set that they have that it seems like it's not working, and I would ask them, and I would I, again I would try to be as direct and as built into the to the media plan that we're going to talk about this, and as we're moving forward here, Jimmy, um, we're going to give you more access as you're being honest and trustworthy and you're handling the level of uh, access that you have now, you're going to keep getting more and more access as you're being trustworthy. And then there are going to be times where I might get annoying and when I'm going to ask you, oh, is this working? Is it not? Because I don't really know. I didn't have this when I was a kid. You know that. So, and I would lean in on that kind of conversation, depending on how old your kid is, to get them to be honest with you. Yeah, it's not working, but they weren't going to say anything. And then- Find a way to, okay, thanks for letting me know. And either you could reset your phone or whatever it is, but ultimately they're going to keep getting around it. And so you have to find a way to have that dialogue and then set a more concrete limit where the phone physically, where it's not just the phone. I got 
many, many people where they give their phone at night, but then they have a MacBook at home and they could tech uh, up in their room and they could text just as easily just on that computer uh, to most people. Um, so again, it's looking at what is, why are they getting around it? Why do they feel it's so unfair? Having a little bit of a dialogue around that and then finding a way to set a limit with the idea that then they're, they're gonna demonstrate trustworthy behavior to get more access. But I wouldn't be surprised or shocked that they're getting around the limits. I would expect that. And you may even, without baiting them, I, I would almost say that to them. And I know you're gonna hear about getting around this and I'm sure your friends have different rules and it may not feel fair. And I promise you it's all gonna be fair, big picture, you're gonna get everything you want, in time. Just like when you're 13, even though you think you could be a really good driver and you drive in the driveway or whatever, not that I'm encouraging that, you can't drive until you're 16 in New York or whatever the date. It's just You're just not allowed to. So we're going to go one step at a time here and you're going to get everything you need. And when you get around the limits, we'll have to, we'll, we'll talk that through and figure out what we need to do. See, it's nuanced. I want to jump in really quickly and also talk about why it's so hard to have a perfect seal as an app. Um, and so when a program runs that's trying to block apps or block people from opening programs, that program is also a program. So it only runs if the device is running properly. So when a device powers on, it prioritizes certain things first and the app that blocks things might not be prioritized first. So there's a window when you turn a phone on that might allow a kid to open up an app. And then some programs, once the app is open, they can't shut it off once it's already been opened up. Mm -hmm. And so what this means is new technology that comes out will probably still have problems and ways to get around it. It isn't just an issue of this problem being brand new. This is a problem for technology design, the way technology works. Appreciate that. I can't hear, I think you're muted. Kathy. Kathy, you, yeah. Oh, sorry there. Um, I said thank you, Milo, for bringing that up um, because there was a question in the group chat of can you, you let us know how kids are getting around the screen limits, the hacks, and that the parent only knew of one or two things. So it sounds like with the constant changing of technology. Um, so, so thank you for answering that. Um, and, I, and I wouldn't even be able to begin, and I'm, Milo knows more about the computer science part of it than I do, but I don't think that'd be a good use of our time. Um, because it's endless. There's so many ways that kids are getting around things that we could spend the rest of the time listing them. Um, right. They're out there. They're Google. You could Google them as our kids are. Um, and uh, but I, but there, there's there's so many ways depending on the device. Right. Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to move into a question, a couple of questions that were asked uh, related to the mental health risks associated with social media. Um, we had a couple of questions come in earlier asking, how do I explain to my 12-year-old daughter the negative mental health risks associated with social media? And is there a specific article that you could recommend to this parent that they can read or, or to her or share with her um, so that she can get information to her child from a sourced, um, you know, verified uh, article? Um, that she thought it would have more of an impact coming from yourself or some other resource rather than just coming from mom or dad. I have to give some thought to a specific article that would be appropriate for, I think you said a 12 year old. Um, I, I would lean on some uh, documentaries um, watching, uh, you know, from the original screenagers, which is not new. Uh, there's a really good one, like that's not new. Um, uh, forgot the what was that one on Netflix uh, a year or two ago? Um, I forgot the name of that right now. But um, but there's there's I, I would you know kids like if kids are visual. I again I don't know this twelve year old, but most twelve year olds I know are not going to read a uh, or you know an article. Um, I, I would watch some you know that they explained. They have one on on teen anxiety. They have um, there's, I would, I would go that route. And, uh, even the original screenagers, as I said, I think does a really nice job explaining how, uh, young 
kids um, are in, at the beginning of their identity formation are in these vortexes, these vacuums of misinformation and trying to be included and and their their emotional brain is hyperactive and hyper focused on being included and, and having all of this information and it's overwhelming and and the rabbit holes and the um you, you look up you know fitness apps uh or fitness on instagram and within a couple of clicks then you're learning about eating disorders and you know there's a lot of layers here that th there's a very direct impact on um, all of our mental health. The, the concern for kids is that their brains are still developing and they don't have the ju judgment center to filter it all through. And that's where our scaffolding comes in. Um, so I'll give some thought if I, if I come to an article that I think would be appropriate for a 12 year old, I'll certainly pass that along. Um, I don't have that in my head right now, um, but I, I would, I would lean on um, well done documentaries that that highlight the those concerns. Great, thank you. Um, along those same lines, um, we had a parent write in. Um, if you could please talk about how to connect with teenagers who are attracted to unhealthy behaviors. Uh, apparently, there seemed to be no interest in having any high moral standards. Um, so, if you could address that. Again, I don't think that started with the internet. The internet is a portal to connecting with anyone and watch a video of anything that you could possibly think of and connect with people, no matter how bad that idea is. There's probably a group. I, you know, I listed a bunch of uh, specific uh, content specific groups for parenting. There's also content specific groups for the most absurd, outrageous, um, awful thing probably. And, you know, um, so, you know, again, I go back to predict, recognize, do different, um, predicting and, and helping our kids predict that, you know, if they're going to seek out that type of information online, unfortunately, and I wouldn't bait them with this, but unfortunately they will find it and they, it, it might scare them. Um, and be aware that there um, that that the information is out there, uh, depending on on the age of the kid, and then try to offer them with fun and enticing ways other things to do that gently nudge them away from that content into something else, and ideally off a screen to go do to go do things especially while you have this window of time as a family and you have a teenager still living at home. And like, again, in another couple of years when they're off in college, you know, you'll still have a vacation here or there, but you know, that's a different phase of, of your family while they're still in, in, at home. You know, I would try to be creative and lean in on getting them to think about what else would they like to do and uh, off of screen, going there, going here, and having, again, leaning in on biology and the five senses, having experiences that um, enhance their lives in a different way, not instead of being online, but, you know, moving in that direction. There's just other ways of getting information because there are those rabbit holes and it's enticing, whether it's YouTube or Instagram, and, it, and it's fed to them. They may not even be looking for it. That, that's the scariest part to me. I hear on, on way more than I would like to, you know, really nice kids who were just, you know, on Instagram scrolling through on reels and, and they get somehow, however the algorithms work, you know, they get fed this thing that is outrageous, but then they watch it and then they get fed more of that because they watched it. And then they get, you know, and, 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 you know, so being aware of that and educating them that that's likely going to happen. And can they start to engineer their feed a little bit where they're looking up things that they want to see more and more, that they're not just passively um, taking in what's being fed them, but they're looking for things. That's a way of changing what's in your reel or, or, or shorts or whatever, that you're looking things up because that changes the algorithm over time. And so that would be one way to, to beyond being off the screen doing things encouraging them to look things up that they actually want to learn more about because make no mistake they are learning online whatever they're watching on instagram they are learning 
And if it's awful, misogynistic, gross things, unfortunately, hopefully they have a judgment on that, that it's not good. But unfortunately, you know, without getting political, like there's a lot of misinformation in there. And that's all, if that's your main only news source, that's what you believe. It's a fine line between a conspiracy theory and your information. And if you have nothing else to fact check it and 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 uh, and 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 have some judgment around, especially if you're 14, um, that's where you know it, it gets um, dangerous. So anyway, okay. so I hope I answered your question. Yep. Offline, no, 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 no. doing things and looking things up to engineer the algorithm to to evoke to feed them different things, so it's more active, less passive. Right. And again, circling back to your earlier comments about communication and dialogue. And so that all feeds in in as well. Yes. That um, is the underlying answer that I'm probably going to have to all of your questions. Okay. This is a parenting webinar tonight. So sure. it's about parenting our kids and my push for all parents in my office and in webinars. And when I travel around the country speaking live, it's trying to encourage parents to meet that obligation to, to connect with their kids, difficult as that is at times, because their kids may not want to hear from you, but that you're finding inroads to connect and have this dialogue. And that's where I use the parental controls because it forces the dialogue. Okay, great. Um, specifically, we had a question come up on Snapchat. So I don't know if this is uh, for you, Dr. Putter or Milo. Um, specifically, why is it so detrimental to teens um, with regards to that Snapchat? So my short answer, at the risk of stating the obvious, as I often do, Snapchat's design is to, 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 to be more secretive, to be more private. Uh, you know, most other messaging apps that are at least popular that I hear about, whether it's Instagram or iMessage or other types of messaging apps, um, parents have access to um, or can have access to. Even Instagram, you could duplicate that on your parent, on the parent's phone. You could log in as your, you know, tweener or teenager with their permission. I wouldn't do it behind their back. Um, and you could sort of monitor things that way. But Snapchat, there really isn't a way to do that. Um, it messes the, the app up if you're logged in on a different phone. Snapchat's, a, and I'm trying to be brief here, but the Snapchat's original um, setup was uh, that things disappeared. Um, nothing disappears. Everything is saved on multiple servers. Milo, you could speak to this if you want. Um, bouncing around multiple satellites. People could screenshot. Um, so it's not really private the way that kids feel and think it is. But it is private in the sense that parents aren't monitoring it. And so, you know, if I'm stating the obvious here, I'm sorry, but that to me, that's why Snapchat is different than these other apps, because it gives kids access to connecting with people um, that they know in real life and from all over the world, potentially, um, you know, without any filter, without any um, regulation there and without any supervision. Uh, and that's to me, to be basic, that's, that's what concerns me the most. And jumping in really quick, what Dr. Pyre says is right. And the way a message is saved is it's saved in a database and Snapchat deletes it from its database very quickly within 24 hours. If a message is opened or within 30 days, if the message is never opened, and that means even Snapchat cannot get these messages again. And once they're deleted, they're gone. The messages are gone, but the pictures, to be clear, often are saved on different servers and on phones through screen, uh, uh, screen snap, uh, what are, screenshots. Yes, if anything is screenshot, right saved that way. But if it's not screenshotted, it can be gone forever. So you can never, you you can't figure out what happened. If some conversation happened between kids, and there's no screenshots, there's no way to find out what was said, for sure. Along those lines, uh, we have a live Q&A that's come in on how much of, uh, it says the budget is allocated to cyber defense for kids 
I'm assuming maybe that's a federal budget. Uh, they didn't say federal versus state. So I would say federal. I don't know if you guys can answer that for us. I have no idea what what, yeah. what that person is referring to. Okay. Cyber defense, I guess in terms, in terms of cybersecurity, I'm sure that's a, okay. that that's beyond me. Um, and I don't think that's filtering down yet mm -hmm. uh, to child safety. There's, so, there's not even basic safety standards for the devices. Mm -hmm. Like your dishwasher at home has safety standards. It can't um, pour boiling water out onto the kitchen floor. That would, you know, the maker of that dishwasher could get sued. Um, phones, like, again, there's no safety standard yet. We're, we're at the very beginning of this process. Right. So I just want to remind everyone, we're getting to the end of our time here. So Kathy, if you want to, we probably have time for about one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap up. So, so um, choose, we have many. <laughs> there, were, there were many great questions. I just want to let everyone know many great, great questions that were already answered in um, Dr. Pletter's presentation. Right. Um, and so, so that's really great there. Um, I would say for our, our last um, question, and, and this is kind of a, this is, an, I'm going to, I'm going to pull one from the live um, and hopefully that person is still on. Um, it says, considering this, this group of people um, is going to run the world in 20 years, are we just raising the same alarms that my crazy uncle did when he questioned what our generation was going to do in the future? Um, so that was, uh, from one of our attendees tonight. Um, so again, considering the this question in there is, are we overreacting and this is just like rock and roll music is the devil kind of thing. I, is that, I think what that's where it's an anonymous person is that I believe that's where it's going. So again, I, my take, um, is, uh, maybe, uh, but probably not. I think this is a, in my experience, again, I was born in the seventies. Uh, I have watched an evolution and a, uh, an acceleration of, of connection and, um, information sharing, both connection with people, real people around the world and information sharing, good information and really, really bad information around the world accelerated at a level that has a major impact on our biological brains and how we're processing, especially for our young kids with their developing brains. And so from my point of view, and, and I'm trying to be brief here uh, to answer that question, I don't think it's the same as that person's crazy uncle, if that's what they said. Um, uh, I think th this is unique and similar to climate change without getting political in the sense that we, it's almost like the new inconvenient truth. It's not the first time I've said this, that we all know, we all feel this concern. We all want clean water. We all want clean air. Um, we are seeing these devastating hurricanes, yet the immediacy of the concern for most of us is not smacking us in the face on a daily or minute to minute, minute basis. So therefore, it's easy to push it away and deal with what's in front of us. From a parenting point of view, it's still something we need to keep in mind. And that's why I've dedicated myself in spreading good information. And even in my nuanced approach, which might frustrate people, because I'm not giving you clear yes or no answers necessarily. I'm a psychologist, so you sort of knew that coming in. Um, but it's the nuanced approach that I am encouraging so we can tolerate and accept and process the overwhelming amount of information and make healthy choices to get to the outcome that we want, which is healthy future adults who will be, to her, to their question, running the world. Like, it's no different. I started this whole program when my daughter was born 20 years ago. Now she works for me, helping me run this thing. Like quite literally, and it's 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 pretty cool to see. Um, and Milo's what twenty four? Yeah, like I'm twenty four. I, also I don't know if you have a different take that you want to add. I know we're out of time, but you it, you know, is it the crazy uncle uh, in your opinion? I, I would say no. Um, I would say um, among young adults, my generation, um, 
we all actively deal with this every day. Um, like I'm, I'm 24. I got my first iPhone when I was 14, which is later than a lot of um, your kids. And I have felt the pull of technology a lot throughout my life. And in college, I became concerned with it and I started studying it um, with computer science. And as an adult, there are times when my technology use is out of control and I'm an adult. So I have to figure out how am I going to rein it back in myself? And I talk to a lot of adults who have jobs who are in their twenties and we talk about, oh yeah, today, like I just, I was on TikTok for three hours. I, I couldn't help myself. And that's okay for a day. Like you can, you can do that for a day, but you have to find a way to not do that the next day. And it's on you. And so being able to do that is a skill you have to learn. And, and it develops over time. It, it's not, you're not going to develop that overnight. Humans learn by doing with practice. So if we're practicing being on TikTok for six hours a day, that's what we're going to get good at, which is not all that marketable as a skill. So I, I like ending on a, on a more upbeat note. Um, I don't know if you have one more question or we could wrap it there, but I, I really appreciate you inviting us up. Um, love to come up in person uh, if that ever could make sense. I, um, I do get up to New York on occasion. Uh, and I really thank you all for inviting me and I appreciate Milo, you, you, you popping in tonight and helping with the Q and a, um, if there's other follow-up questions, um, you have my email info at iparent101.com do my best. I'm a full-time clinician, so it's not always easy for me to get back to people quickly, but I'm happy to, to continue to support the community as best I can. Um, you have my ebook, um, again, definitely, uh, click around the website. There's a lot of free uh, resources on there that I've uh, painstakingly uh, put together uh, and I hope uh, provides some comfort and um, support scaffolding uh, for parents out there as we all move forward. So again, thank you so much. And I really appreciate uh, your attention. This is an awkward thing talking to myself in my computer. I hope it all came through clearly. And, did. Uh, it I did. And I want to I want to thank you. I was going to say, I thought you were incredibly engaging talking to a computer. So excellent job. And thank, thank you again you. for sharing for sharing your knowledge and expertise. Um, there actually was a suggestion in one of the we did, one of the questions we didn't get to. Someone wanted to um, bring speakers into individual school districts to really encourage this conversation to happen amongst all the grades. And I would encourage that person or others that are out there watching to contact their schools and PTAs and possibly reach out to Dr. Plutter or others that do this work to encourage the conversations within their districts. Um, so I just want to be conscious of time. It is now 8.34. Um, Lisa, I think is going to pop up one last screen for our one more opportunity to take our survey. Um, if not, you will get that in the follow-up email while, with all of Dr. Pletter's resources. Um, okay, there we go. Anyway, have a great evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Goodbye. Thank you. Thanks again, Dr. Platter. We're not we're not gone yet, so I'll continue to thank you. <laughs> we had a, a really nice audience. I think there were a hundred and over 130, and everyone remained on. Like it was really nice to see no one, no one dropping off as you went through. Um, so thanks again for coming. I thought you did a great job. I wasn't kidding. It is hard, I think, to talk to a screen and be engaging. And I really thought you did did a great job. Thank so, yeah. um, and I just wish we had time for more questions. Let's see. There were a lot of questions that came in and it's very hard to, uh, sift through them and pick out the ones that would be best, you know, answered live. So, you know, well, we do our and, best. And again, that means that in your communities, cause I know this is a, a collective, there's a lot yes. of engagement out there and a lot of concerns. And, you know, so I, again, I probably yeah, it is. But it is absolutely and I wish we had gotten I wish we had gotten more into the school policy with Milo, but that is something obviously everybody is talking about. We actually have um 
in our school district, I didn't organize it. Well, actually, I helped a little bit, but the PTA is bringing in Max Stossel. Do you know Social Awakenings? Yeah. I don't know if you're familiar with I, them. I, know, I actually but know Max. Yes. You knew him. Okay. Well, I'll tell him you said that you. I met you. I'm um, mm -hmm. actually. He's coming on Thursday of this week. It's like a big social he's media been, week for fantastic. our district. He he so. was featured in that in the documentary like that I was referring to before. Uh, yes. Okay. Years ago. Uh, okay. And I, and I guess we have to stop talking. <laughs> Lisa's telling me she has to turn us off. So I 